And welcome in to the newest edition of Caught Stealing, the fantasy baseball podcast here at Fantasy Alarm. I'm Colby Conway at Colby R. Conway over on X. And with me here, Matt Sells at The Sells Man. Matt, I'm having a little deja vu because I was just about to say another good week for you or on the track, not necessarily on the field, but on the track. And I was like, I feel like I just said this last week. And you know what? It's because I did. Yeah, maybe knowing that we're recording these baseball podcasts on Sunday nights is a good omen for NASCAR. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it was in the betting capital of the world. Las Vegas had a pretty good DFS day. You can check out my Twitter, see the betting day uh, that we posted out there, too. Uh, FA YouTube had a grill versus grill video where I had a winning bet on there, too. So, you know, follow Twitter. Check out NASCAR when we have races, which is every weekend between now and November. Yeah. You know. Um, but yeah, I also made a baseball trade this week. Oh, my home league. All right, let's hear it. So, uh, in my home league, we get to <clears throat> you can keep guys for three years guaranteed, you could extend them for a fourth if you want to. Um, so I have Brian Bayo of the mm-hmm. Red Sox for 350 this year out of a hundred dollar budget. Pretty good deal, okay. right? Um, and I probably would have kept him next year had everything panned out, right? I traded him for a prospect, one Mr. Cade Horton of the Cubs, mm-hmm. starting pitching prospect. My number three right-handed pitching prospect in my rankings behind um, Yoshinubu Yamamoto and a guy Colby loves in Paul Skeens. Mm-hmm. Um, I have Horton right behind those those guys. So, you know, I, I feel I feel pretty decent about that. Yeah, I have not made any uh, trades in my home league. I have one one league where we just established our our uh, keepers. So that's and then the draft's coming up soon. So looking forward to that. But I am in the Great Fantasy Baseball Invitational. That draft is happening now. Um, what round did you make it to? Because one of our colleagues, I think, is in the slowest is in the slowest league. I think I'm in the second fastest one. Um, as You're we're recording what, this, 15? no, as we're recording this tonight, we're round twenty four. Look at you go. Yeah, and I uh, just filled my starting shortstop and middle infield position. Deep. Uh, sure. Shortstop, shortstop is deep. Uh, other than that. <laughs> well, no, I, it can be deep, but it's not great. I'm, look, I'm looking at the team now, and I don't really love it, but it is it is what it is. But I tell I will. You never know how this is going to play out. I that's mean. true. And I went, um, I'm going to call it bully ball. I don't know if you can call it that, but I – I double tapped catcher early because 15 team two catcher league. I said, I last year I went back to back catch or not back to back, but I went two catchers early with real Muto and Adley. And this year I said, I really, I was like this year I'm getting Adley and I'm getting another stud catcher because I'm getting two catchers right away. I know there's value behind the dish and actually check out the draft guide this week here at fantasy alarm. And you'll see me talking about some value catchers. Um, actually, maybe even by the time you're listening to the recording, I know. See, even the cats. Yeah, excited. my cat. If you're watching this, you could just see me. It's probably the article is probably well, live now. Get rid of a cat. The article is probably live now, but talking about some value <laughs> catchers. But I went Adley and William Contreras. I said I'm going nice. to get two stud catchers, and then early on, maybe, maybe, maybe next week, if the draft's done, we'll go through my whole team. But uh, uh, yeah, my uh, <laughs> let me tell you this, just one last thing, real quick. Here, <laughs> here is my starting infield. Okay. Okay. First base is Bryce Harper. Not bad. Second base is Gavin Lux. I'll take it. Shortstop is... I did take it. I took Gavin Lux in Mm -hmm. our NL West preview. Well, in our NLS preview, I took Orlando Arcia, and he is my starting shortstop. And at third base, I got someone who we might talk about a little bit later from the Kansas City Royals at a value. We might. might. See, we're putting our money where our mouth is. We talk about these things, and then we pick them. I will tell you the the one thing that has me very excited and scared to death about my TGFBI team is a, it's a lot of players that I've been touting and that I really like. So you know what that means. I'm yeah. going to do very very good, or I'm going to do <laughs> very gonna very, do very not very, good. Very... <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's those are the only, that's yeah, the only two ways this thing is playing happens out. in in NASCAR. The weeks where I like my builds generally doesn't go so well. The weeks that I'm like this is the ugliest lineup I've put together. Generally, it winds up in my favor in terms of winning money. So, um, you know, at least we're putting our money where our uh, mouths are and standing on the guys that we are touting and feel good about 
And that's hey. the thing you can do is trust your gut. Is that's rule number one in fantasy is trust your gut. If I'm going down swinging, I'm going down with my guys. There you go. I'm not gonna have losing team because somebody else likes player A and I don't, and I took player A because of group think or crowdsourcing or whatever. So I'm going down with my guys. But you know, you said bad lineup there, and I'm gonna use that as a segue into a bad lineup. Coming into the offseason, there were a lot of questions around the Giants lineup, right? Yes. We've had we've we've asked a few. But it's turning out it, it got better. Hey. Obviously, they brought in uh, Jung Hu Lee earlier in the offseason. Then they get Jorge yes. Soler. And as if that right handed power bat wasn't enough, they go get a power bat who also happens to have a very, very, very good glove. So Matt Chapman comes out to the Bay Area. If I'm not mistaken, it was a three year deal, but he's got two opt outs. So basically, it's another one year proven. It's it's the same thing. Yeah, he's a Boris client. It's basically yep. the same deal that Cody Bellinger got just for $30 million less. Yep. Right. It's the same thing. And by the way, how salty does Matt Chapman have to be to turn down well over a hundred million dollars from Toronto to wind up with half that from San Francisco, which is going to tank his offensive numbers. Um, good for San Fran. They needed a third baseman. Mm -hmm. They got a gold glove caliber third baseman defensively and a guy who can absolutely just hit bombs no matter where uh, he's playing. And yeah, you, I mean, Jung Hu Lee does not have to be the power bat that everybody was hoping he would be. He can be the on-base guy, which is what he probably is, right? And then you can turn the lineup over to Jorge Soler, who hit 38 bombs in Miami and hit 48 bombs in Kansas City, so we're not concerned about power. And then turn that lineup over to Matt Chapman, who could probably still hit 35 home runs. I mean, yes, he's going to have to play in San Fran for half his games. He also gets to play a chunk of games in Arizona. Pretty good hitter spark. Gets to play in Dodger Stadium. Pretty good hitters park. Oh, what's the other one? Coors. He gets a bunch of games in Coors, which is a pretty good hitters park. So um, I'm not concerned about the offense. He'll slot right into the middle of that lineup. And the Giants are looking to If they can figure out the rest of their rotation, they're looking sneaky for that seventh playoff spot in the NL. And Chapman's glove helps the infield defense, which right. helps pitchers a little bit. So if you like that, that'll be there for you. And here's the thing with Chapman, too, last year. Sure, 17 home runs. He had 39 doubles, too. It's one of those things where yeah. what if a little like, loft. All of all of Toronto's offense did not produce the home runs right. we thought. So, like, it was yeah. an approach thing. It wasn't just a him. I mean, Vlad didn't do it. Bichette didn't do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, n none of their – Big bats that we expected. Dalton Farsho didn't do anything. Alejandro Kirk had an utterly abysmal year. So, yeah, I'm not concerned about the, the power from Matt Chapman. And he's got a 48.1% hard hit rate for his career. And last year, really, if you go back and look at the, the his 2023 season, a bad second half really took some shine off what was actually a really good first half from Chapman. So, I like this move. I'm not worried about it. And if Jung Hu Lee can be this guy that gets on base a ton, Chapman could very well work his way into that heart of the order. If you think he's going to hit fifth or sixth to begin the year, even with some of the names the Giants have, they're still going to need some offense. Don't be surprised, especially against lefties, if you see Chapman hitting fourth fifth maybe like i mean he crushed he's always he's always been very good against lefties don't be surprised to see chapman flirting with some at bats in the middle of the heart of the order and then otherwise i mean he's still probably gonna hit probably what sixth maybe fifth probably hang out right yeah. outside of it yeah, yeah so probably um this also by the way takes pressure off of some of their touted bats that they have mm -hmm. down in their system uh that don't necessarily that aren't necessarily full go yet um so these signings really quite help the depth there. Um, so nice, nice ad there, San Francisco. Yeah. So after we crapped on them for a good bit, things are turning around. I kind of actually like what they're doing here. Yeah. All um, they did was go out and add like 70 potential well, home runs to their lineup. Yeah. That's it. That's all they did. So that's all they did. That's not so bad, right? All right. Now here's the one we got to talk about here. So knee soreness for Ronald Acuna it is in yes. that knee that was surgically repaired uh, from the ACL issue that he had back in 21. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's 21. Back in 21, 
So let me ask you this. We don't really have a ton of information yet as we're recording this on Sunday night. It's very up in the air. You look on Twitter, it's about or on X, it's about the same thing as when you have a when you have a slight tickle in your throat and you look on WebMD and you can see, well, it's either nothing to, you know, I need to go to the ER immediately. That's right. Exactly. We have no clue where we're falling on Acuna yet. So let me ask you this. We're recording this on Sunday night. Y'all are listening to this. It's Monday afternoon. Let's say you have a draft tonight, aka Monday, March 4th at 7 p.m. You have the first overall pick. Are you still taking Ronald Acuna with what you know at this time? Yes. Okay. Because let's put it this way. The likelihood that it's a rest and rehab thing is probably pretty good. The -hmm. chance that it's a minor procedure that amounts to roughly the same time frame as rest and rehab is also likely pretty good. I saw a a pretty nice breakdown on X from an accredited uh, surgeon who was you know, showing uh, x-rays and, and diagrams of what the meniscus is and gave basically four scenarios. The fourth scenario was he basically needs it to be, recon- like, remove the meniscus, put new ones in, and cost them the season. That's almost unlikely to happen, right? Mm-hmm. So if we're talking that he's out, let's say, three to four weeks at this point based on what we're supposing, you're not missing, you're missing maybe two weeks of April at that point. And so are we going to get another 40, 70 season? No, but you weren't going to get that anyway, even if the, the, the knee was healthy, right? If you're banking on, let's say a 30, 50 season, he's still the number one pick, Mm -hmm. right? So, and the guys that you're going to have to pivot to, I'm not sure are true pivots right now. I would say if we record this next week and we know more information and it's more like, oh, it's a six to eight week thing, then yeah, I'm strongly considering not taking him number one overall. But as of right now, presuming it's a rest and maybe we don't see him again during spring training, which he doesn't really need anyway, and we get him in the middle of April, I'm perfectly fine. I mean, he went in the first round the year he was – coming back from an ACL mm. and we knew we were going to miss what a month right I mm. think it was 2022 ADP still had him as like a back end first rounder second round guy so no I'm, I'm not it's going to take quite a lot of time missed for Acuna to drop out of number one for me do you have any reservation again it's going to come let's say it is like the rest and rehab I mean, okay, let me say it this way. I don't know if he's going to steal 70 bases again. Pretty confident he's probably not. Do you have any reservation that they maybe slow play him a little bit or hold the reins back on the base paths a little bit, at least in the early going? I mean, okay, so let's let's play this game. Who's who's the number two pick right now? Julio? I mean, I would be taking Bobby Witt. Bobby Witt. Okay, Bobby Witt's going to do what, 30-30? I, I hope 30, a little. 35. I hope 30, 40. Okay. So if you're assuming 30, 40, let's also say that even slow playing Acuna, Acuna still gets to 30, 35. Or okay. 35, 30. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Acuna is going to have a better batting average. Most likely. He's in a better lineup. So the run production is higher. Well, that's a bold take. And the. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. scoring, I tried. I tried to do it without laughing. I really and did. Runs and runs scored is still going to be high because he's in a very deep lineup. As long as he gets on base, he's got a very good shot of scoring. Right. right. Mm-hmm. So even if he's a thirty-five thirty guy, and those amount to the same stats as Bobby Witt and Julio, he still has a better average. He still has more run production, and he's still going to score more runs. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm still taking him number one. <laughs> Like, he's going to have to drop to, like, what Trey Turner did last year for me not to take him number one. Hmm. Fair enough. Cool. And then if you're in a league where maybe the the person who has the first overall pick gets a little cold feet and goes elsewhere, how fast do you slam the yes button on Acuna? Now you have value. As soon as he goes past one, (laughs) 
unless you've seen a report that says he's going to be out months, right? right. If he's out months, no. He's um, waiting. We'll have to see. Yep. If he's out a matter of weeks at this point, I'm still smashing the yes is the number one pick. Fair enough. We'll keep an eye out for that. And then a couple of other pieces of injury news, or at least one that I'll highlight here. We don't have to go too deep into it because it's a very easy pivot. David Bednar, right lat tightness. No real issue there. But with Pittsburgh signing a role to Chapman in the offseason, right there is your there's your clear step. So there yep. you go with that one. So Matt, let's go ahead. Let's dive into this again. Early spring headlines, fact or fiction, just like we've done the last couple of weeks. This week, yep. I did not put the statement in there. Actually, no, I did. did I did. I did not read it though. Well, it's white text on a white background. So sneak, you know, big brain, big brain. You know how brain. it is. And since, since I just brought up the pirates, I'll segue that perfectly. So if you've seen Cabrian Hayes, and Henry Davis yes. have looked very good. Yes. They um, Cabrian They're Hayes. Hitting it hard. Yep. Davis has two home runs. Hayes has two home runs, both hitting 350 plus. Both have an OPS over 1,200. And we saw Davis show his power in a very brief sample uh, last year at the big league level. Oh, very brief. So kind of a exaggeration in a smallish sample size. And last year, Cabrian Hayes had 15 home runs. For the Pirates in 2023, but fact or fiction based on the early spring numbers, both Cabrian Hayes and Henry Davis both hit 20 home runs in 2024. I would say fact, assuming that they're healthy. I don't see the correct any answer. Reason, I don't see any reason why either guy can't do it. They have the skill set. That's what they were drafted to do. Cabrian Hayes plays third base. You need pop at the corner infield. Um, not that 20 is a remarkable stat anymore mm-hmm. for third baseman, but um, I would I would say, yeah, if, if they stay healthy, then yes, it's a fact that both would hit 20 home runs. And uh, Henry Davis had seven home runs and 10 doubles in 62 games last season. So that is a fact. That is correct. Um, You are one for one. Congratulations. Um, I like that. So next one, the Chicago Cubs offseason acquisition, Shoto Imanaga, mixed results, three earned runs and two in the third innings, but did have five strikeouts. The lefty splitter is going to be interesting. So fact or fiction? Imanaga strikes out 150 batters this year and posts a sub four ERA. I'm going to say fact. Two for two. I think I, I, are we looking at a Kodai Senga year? I don't think so. I mean, mm-hmm. Kodai, the second half for Kodai was amazing mm-hmm. last year. Um, we're not getting anywhere close to what Yamamoto is going to do for the Dodgers. Yep. Imanaga is not, not that caliber of pitcher. Uh, the Cubs got a great deal on signing him for what they did. But um, I would say probably 380 RA. And I don't know. I'd, I'd feel fine going a tick below a strikeout per inning, right around the strikeout an inning, somewhere in there. My best ball teams like what you're talking about there, strikeout per inning and a sub four ERA. My team's like that. Let me ask you one last one here. Bailey Ober, seven strikeouts with 11 whiffs in his most recent outing. And he's only like seven foot nine. So he gets halfway to home plate with his stride. So the elite extension is obviously on full display for his career in the bigs. 292 and two thirds innings pitched with 290 three strikeouts last year, just a hair over a strikeout per inning. So this year, this year, 2024 coming off a year where he threw 144 innings for the twins. Does Bailey over get to 175 strikeouts in 2024? That's a good number. Cause now I got to calculate like for his career, he's done a strikeout an inning. Right, so you're saying he pitched 144 innings last year. You assume about 30 innings gained a year is probably what the Twins would like to see from over. Mm-hmm. So assuming he's healthy, that puts him at 174, 175. I think that's right on the money. I'm not going to say that he goes over it. I think you're pretty close to what 
the over under line should be. He should be right around there. Um, I don't know if that's mm-hmm. a. I'll, I'll go push. I guess. Okay, fair enough. I'm okay with that one. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't have a preference on that one like I did the other two. I don't have many shares of over, so I'm not a. Uh, I'm not. And I'm not in that camp, so I'm okay with it. But You're not I'll go overly with the high on him. No, I was trying to come up with a pun right there with Ober, and I I knew it was going to be with over and over, but I couldn't come up with something, and I had to pivot. So because you beat dad, me to that. They, yeah, I'm, I'm a dad. I get the downloaded database of puns and dad jokes. That's true, and 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 you used it ex- <laughs> you used it exquisitely there. So who am I, who am I to who am I to argue? But Matt, let's go ahead and move here to discourse from the Discord. So once again, if you are an All Pro subscriber, you can be in our Discord. You can get access to uh, the salesman's brain and the dad database of dad jokes and all other information that you get when you get to download that that uh, that file to your hard drive. Um, so you get all that access. You get access to me and whatever thoughts come into this brain. Whatever they end up Mostly being, mostly pirates related. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, if you if you want if, if you want <laughs> blinded Texans, if it. you want blinded bias, I'm your guy with really good information <laughs> there. So, and then of course, obviously, everyone else that we got at Fantasy Alarm, and you get access to everything we have on the site, including Matt's uh, NASCAR content with some of those with the playbook and everything. So, make sure you check that out. But if you're an All Pro subscriber, you do get access to us in the Discord. You get to ask us questions, and maybe your question will be featured in an episode of Caught Stealing. And this week. Uh, we have a question. We're not talking keepers. We're not talking who to draft. We're talking league settings. And this one's interesting. So Matt, I'm going to kick it to you first. But do you prefer saves, saves only leagues, or leagues that value saves plus holds, aka solds? So I'm going to go at this perhaps in a different way than what's expected, right, than, than a pure answer. My response to this question when I saw it in the Discord, because we – Ask you all to, you know, hey, what's on your mind? We'll answer it on the pod. Um, my thought on this is, do you want a shallower player pool or do you want a deeper player pool? Mm-hmm. So if you're in a saves only league, it shallows. It makes the, the player pool more shallow because the guys that are in middle relief that may get holds. They, unless two dudes get injured or get traded or lose their job or get demoted you're generally not getting saves from that guy so he's essentially useless to you unless they're putting up such good ratios in a lot of innings for a reliever that you can make an argument to help your your ratios or strikeout numbers if you want a deeper player pool uh and ones that make it a easier to make transactions or stream people or you know create more movement on the waiver wire i would go with saves and holds um saves have become such a hard thing to project and our uh buddy greg jewett does a great job uh over on x and uh, you can find his sites there uh of you know, giving you the lay of the land for relievers and where each one's, you know, going and, and kind of how to pick the next closer for a team. Um, so I would say I am a bigger fan of the solds format that counts more useful uh, stats for players because, let's face it, managers are using, they, they may not, you know, outright say, oh, yeah, I wanted to get this guy a hold. But they're putting certain relievers in save situations later in the game that count as holds because they know the leverage and they want to win and they know this guy is good in leverage spots and so you should get credit for that. So um, I prefer solds leagues. I have yet to have any luck um, getting my home league to consider that. Um, but that that's a pretty tight player pool to begin with in a variety of other ways. So uh, my answer is sold. How, how about you there, Colby? Yeah, I'd love to disagree with you, but I can't. I love I love leagues that value holds. Um, I had one I had one long running home league that we started up in college where basically saves was a category. Technically, holds weren't, but those setup guys could either be the next man up or they could help boost your ratios and do stuff like that. And when you look last year, I mean, if we look back at 2023, as I pulled up here, we had 12 closers with at least 30 saves. 
So cool. When you go to pitchers with holds, there was only three with 30. But when you start combining saves and holds, we start getting like Tanner Scott had 30 plus. Uh, your boy Joel Pyamps from Milwaukee had 30 plus. Um, a couple others, Jason Foley in Detroit, Eric Swanson, Tyler Rogers, Yenier Cano, he had eight saves. You can start to you can start to kind of replicate the real life game more because right. and you hit the point in the head that was going to be my driving point to this that you took, but it's good that we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> yes, teams have a closer they put out in the ninth inning. Their second best reliever is not always used in the eighth. It right. could be the seventh. It could be the sixth, the fireman role, if you will. If the team's winning and they put him in, like, look at last year. Like, you could look at a guy like yeah. Brian Abreu or Yenier Cano. Well, let me use Brian Abreu for this. Yeah. Actually, no, let me use Hector Neris. Hector Neris only had two saves worthless in this, in the terms of like saves only league. Well, let me but guess he, had he had 25. 31 holds tied for the league lead. He won six games. He had a sub two ERA and 77 right. strikeouts. If you go to Brian Abreu, he only, he had five saves, 24 holds, but he had a hundred strikeouts with a sub two ERA. And that went more or less completely wasted in a ton of leagues. You can replicate the real life game more if you do saves plus holds. And also when you're drafting, you don't have to pay up for the elite closer. So you right. can get the stud hitters. You can get another stud pitcher at that point. Because sure, you could pay up for Emmanuel Classe, David Bar David Bednar, Camilo Duvall, or Camilo Duvall, excuse me, with 44 and 39 and 39 saves respectively. Or just wait till the end of the draft, get Yenier Cano. You could have picked up uh, Joel Piamps. If you could have drafted three next men up, and basically had a rock solid bullpen that would have competed with someone else who spent two of their first 10 picks on stud closers. I like safe plus hold leagues personally. Yeah, it just it it makes more players usable. And I'm a fan because the biggest problem that people have with roto baseball is if you're in a saves, let's say you're in a saves league and you're in average and you know a standard five by five roto. If your team doesn't have a good April there's a reasonable argument to be made that you're not going to enjoy the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. I don't subscribe to that thinking because there's moves you can make. But if you're in a 15-team league, and you just said it, last year there were 12 closers with 30 saves. So now you know that the benchmark to at least get to the middle of the pack is 30 saves. If you don't have one of those closers, you ain't getting to the middle of the pack. Now you got to go make up ground in other categories, which, by the way, tough to find midseason aside from, like, power. Or, right. you know, the one category guys you can find. So I'm a fan of the Solds uh, leagues. It just deepens things. It makes more moves possible. It makes draft strategy way more intriguing. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my viewpoint. Yep, I'm the same. Saves and holds. That would be my vote. Oh, boy. All right, Matt. Come to the pivotal time here. Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right. It's the AL Central Divisional <laughs> Preview and Fantasy yeah. Challenge, just like we've been doing. We talked before we jumped on air. This division gave us more options to pick from than maybe any other division. But the problem None was... that we're particularly happy with. <laughs> yes. The other... No, the other... We, did not, we did not adjust the ADP rules for this nope. division either. Nope. We, we kept, kept the it. Same, kept the same ones. I had more to choose from and less that I liked compared to other divisions. Correct. We had the quantity here but not the quality. Yes. So, uh, Matt, I do believe you won the Twitter poll last week, too. I think so. I think it was you. So I think you're I think you're you're up on the season series thus far on me. But AL Central, quick reminder for everyone for all of the rules here. So again, you can't take two players from the same team, can't take two players from the same grouping of position, aka catcher, infield, outfield, starter, reliever. Players ADP since January 1st per NFBC data has to be outside the top 175, except for catcher. Anything goes there. Positional eligibility indicated by NFBC to begin the season. We'll make one little caveat to that depending on league settings. And we're using standard ESPN scoring. So we will serpentine this, Matt. So I'll I'll let you go first with the catcher because you won last week. So you get to go okay. first. Um, so my catcher comes from Minnesota. We're going with a guy that I am 
struggling on a keeper decision with in my home league because I actually have him. He's valuable to me in a two-catcher league. Uh, Ryan Jeffers for the Minnesota Twins. I don't know that anybody's talking about this guy. Clearly, the ADP bears that out because he's going in the 200s. Uh, so I didn't even have to break the ADP rule to go get this guy. He hit 18 homers last year, had a pretty solid batting average in general, not just for catchers. He hit in like the 250s, 261 range. Should do that again. Uh, he's getting all of the starts at catcher. And if he's not catching, they can plop him in DH if they really need his bat in the lineup. But either way, in the early 200s, you're getting a guy with 20 homer pop and a 250 plus batting average at catcher. Perfectly fine with me. I'm taking Ryan Jeffers. Fair enough. I'm going to go with a guy that I really like this year. I'm going to go with Bo Naylor. Before I go into it, head over to fantasyalarm.com. Article should be posted at the first edition of the Catcher Spotlight. Go read that I think Bo Naylor could be one of only maybe three or four catchers that reaches a certain statistical threshold this year. I'm going to leave it at that. So make sure you head over to Fantasy Alarm to check it out. But last year, we did see Naylor in 67 games hit 11 home runs, slug 470 with a 232 ISO. And really, for, for a young guy in the bigs, showed advanced feel for the strike zone, which is something that I really like. And again, this year, he will be the team's starting catcher for the full season. And I believe he's relatively unchallenged for at bat. So I like Bo Naylor as my backstop here. In the AL Central, I do believe he was just inside the top 175, but I followed the rules. Anything goes except for catcher. Yeah, I think he's cl- I think he's like 162. He's pretty close. He's certainly closer than uh, some other guys you have gone with to rig the vote in your favor. <laughs> You're darn right. It's the only it's the only one I won too. So, <laughs> yeah. Listen, when it's your podcast, you got to do what you got to do to win these games. Um, uh, well, Serpentina infield. I'm going to Edward Julian. I just for the love of God, please don't strike out 30 percent of the time this season hit yeah, lefty's just a concern. smidge better um in obp leagues he gets a massive boost because he just yeah. i mean he walked i believe it was 15 15.7 percent of the time last year 98th percentile walk rate in his first taste of big league pitching really interesting 98th percentile walk rate last year 100th percentile chase rate meaning he understands how to stay in the zone but a 26th percentile whiff rate and an eighth percentile so if he's missing rate. the pitches in the zone, he should be able to hit. <laughs> Pretty much. That's yeah, what it he means. He should also but... get plenty of playing time, too, because they traded the guy that was starting in front of him. Yep. So. Again, it would need to be a little bit or a little bit better against lefties if they give you the chance. But last year, 16 homers, 16 doubles, 459 slug across 109 games. Good enough lineup there, especially with a supposedly fully healthy Byron Buxton who could set the league on fire. But his ADP wasn't. You know, I couldn't use him, but Edward Julian's my infielder. Where are you going in infield? You actually could have used Byron Buxton. You just chose not to. No, um, no. I like Julian. For infield, for me, I'm going down uh, I-35. We're going to go from Minnesota down to Kansas City. We're going to go to Michael Garcia, mm-hmm. third baseman for the Royals, which I believe is your starting third baseman in TGFBI. Too close sure to is. Loop. Um, guy's got a nice power-speed combo. The mm-hmm. batting average is a little questionable, mm-hmm. I'll grant you. But uh, he should be in the range of a 2010 year with homers and steals, and that's perfectly fine out of a young third baseman. Even if he hits at the bottom of the Royals order, he's got the top four hitters hitting essentially behind him, so he should still get some decent uh, chances to hit stuff. And if all goes right, you're talking about a 25-10 245 third baseman. I'll take it. He's going pretty far in the like the early 200s. So you're getting some serious value out of him. Um, and then I guess I'm starting off outfield. Sure are. Here's where the caveat comes in. NFBC has this guy listed as a util spot. However, if you play in a league that does not have a util spot, this guy would qualify at outfield. Talking Aloy Jimenez from the White Sox. Yep. There's a risk. Yes. A, plays for the White Sox. That's a risk. B, <laughs> bigger risk, injury concerns. This mm-hmm. guy generally can't stay healthy. That's why they moved him to DH. Hopefully, moving him to DH keeps him on the field so he doesn't like yank a tricep trying to catch a 
foul ball against the or a fly ball against the fence. Um, you know, avoid those things. He's got pop when he's in when he's in the lineup. I think everybody knows that there's no speed here. Should have a decent enough batting average that he's not going to kill you. And if he stays healthy, there's 30 home run pop. He'll be hitting in the middle of the White Sox lineup, which still has decent power in it. I mean, everybody loves Robert. Yuan Moncada still there. He's got some pop. Uh, another guy that I can now talk about because we passed infield. I almost went with Andrew Vaughn. Has decent pop. Um, and I believe the guy you're going with has okay pop. <sighs> yeah, you could say that. Um <laughs> Let me give you. <laughs> let me tell you how. Let me tell you how good I feel about this one. Ready for this? So, uh, yes, uh, my outfielder is Andrew Beniten- Benintendi. He'll get at bats. He's there. Uh, my starting pitcher is Kenta Maeda. He's the one I'm really excited about. I don't really want to talk about Andrew Benintendi. He's just the guy no, I had to pick. He just he had to be there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But head over to fantasyalarm.com. Go to the Fantasy Alarm Fantasy Baseball Draft Guide. If you don't have it yet, get a copy of it today. Kent Maeda is one of my sleepers. I put in the article. He was very, very good uh, down the stretch last season. Yes. He did submit some time in the beginning of the year, but in the second half of the season, his numbers rivaled Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler. And again, down the stretch amongst qualified starters, 10.35 K per nine, uh, 12th best in baseball during that stretch, 28.2% strikeout rate was the 10th best and the 13th best. If you take the strikeout minus the walk rate, he was there. Honestly, pitchers tend to fare well in the AL Central because, as you can hear by some of the players' names that we're reading off, some lighter offenses in this division. And really let's say. big ballparks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he's going to be, I think he's going to be quite good in a pitcher friendly AL Central. And hopefully he can generate a few more ground balls. Last year, he did post one of the lower ground ball rates of his career, if not the lowest, if I remember correctly. But even pitching for Detroit, if Maeda stays healthy, there's a path to a sub four ERA, and maybe he can flirt with double digit wins. If it's double digit, it will be ten. It will not be more than that. It will be ten. That's but hey, that's double digits. So I'm not lying. So Kenta Maeda, sleeper in your drafts, my pick as my starter here from the AL Central. I took Maeda. You do have the Tigers left, but I don't think you're using a Tiger starter. I do. Um Originally in my build, I did have Kenta Maeda, but mm-hmm. we decided that we didn't. If you're asking people to compare, don't really like having same players in the lineups and then having you vote on others. So I switched it up. Uh, there's another starter that I do like in this range here. Tristan McKenzie for the Guardians. I'm aware that he had a very injury-shortened season last year. He's feeling good. So far, the early spring, so-so. Not not so bad. Um, he should be in about the 140 inning mark is what I'm hearing that they're going to try and go full bore with him. Strikeouts are going to be pretty good. Cleveland's got arguably the best offense in this division. Arguably, maybe the twins. I don't know. It's either the twins or the guardians, I would think, um, top to bottom. So he's going to have some decent shots to win as long as he can stay healthy and the strikeouts will be there. So it's a riskier pick, granted. But when he's been healthy, he's put up 10 plus K per nine, pretty reasonable ratios. Um, It's all about the health for him. And then to close mine off, I have Detroit left and a reliever left. I'm going to get a bargain closer here. We're going to go with Alex Lang. It's not appealing, to be honest. It's I need a reliever. He's, I mean, he's the closer, right? He should get, as long as he remains in that role, 15 to 20 saves, maybe. The ratio is not going to be good. He should strike out a decent amount of people, but you're going to have to eat not the best uh, ratio. The only benefit is he's the closer and doesn't rack up that many innings, so it shouldn't totally kill you. Agreed. I have the Royals left. I'm going to go with Will Smith. I I don't know if he fully emerges as the closer there. One would think his contract gives him a little bit of a leg up, especially if they want to flash him in the beginning of the year and then maybe look to deal him because they do have two other guys, uh, notably James MacArthur, who is one I actually considered going with here. But I'm going to go with Will Smith. To be honest. (laughs) Yeah, I I wouldn't be surprised if Will Smith leads the Royals and saves in the first half. They ship him out at the deadline to a contending team. And the one thing that does give me a little bit of pause – 
other than that at the beginning of the year is if you look at the projected bullpen for the Royals, there's not many lefties in it. Right. The team and may not be able to hold Smith until the ninth. Right. So because maybe McArthur's the better pick. But yeah, you're forfeiting lefty matchups. Yeah. Um another guy, another two guys I consider Garrett Crochet for the White Sox. Yes, yep. another injured guy. They're trying him out as a starter, which means you may get some wins, some innings out of him that way. If that doesn't work, he'll go back to relief. He can get holds uh, for sure. He's got strikeout stuff. Early spring reports are that he's hitting triple digits again. Um, So we'll see. The other guy I thought about was Scott Barlow from Mm -hmm. Cleveland, who's number two in line there um, behind Class A. So there's a handful of saves. A lot of holds, pretty good ratio, strikeouts. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there, there were some interesting choices, right? Like, infield, you could have gone Cole Keith. Or Yoan Moncada. Right? Or Yoan Moncada. Um, you could have also gone Andrew Vaughn yep. from the White Sox, which is basically a cheaper Anthony Rizzo at this mm-hmm. point. Um, outfield, you could have looked at Kerry Carpenter or Parker yes. Meadows, depending on where you fall on I those two. Parker, I thought about Parker Meadows for a nice little speed combo, plus he's the leadoff guy for Detroit, which has to count for something, right? He's going to get a decent amount of at-bats. Mm-hmm. Um, Nelson Velasquez from the Royals. Mm-hmm. Again, another 20-homer bat. Like This is why you don't necessarily have to chase a boatload of power at the beginning. Because we just named four dudes that you've not heard of that are going in the 300s that can hit 20 home runs. Yep. Right. Um, I also had Kenta Maeda. I really love that pick, to be honest. Uh, MJ Melendez could count for an outfield. Mm-hmm. He, sure he theoretically is the leadoff guy in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Hitting in front of uh, Bobby Witt and Pasquantino. <laughs> you should get some stuff to hit. You... So, you certainly would think, but we, so Matt, those are our two lineups. Actually, let me, I'll recount those quick. So yeah. you've got Ryan Jeffers, Michael Garcia, Eloy Jimenez, Tristan McKenzie, Alex Lang. I got Bo Naylor, Edward Julian, Andrew Benintendi, Kenta Maeda, and Will Smith. If you are an all pro subscriber, you're in the fantasy alarm discord. You can drop your lineup there on X. If you follow me at Colby R. Conway, I will have probably by the time you're listening to this, the tweet posted where you can vote on whose lineup is better, mine or at the salesman's lineup. Then you can reply to that with your own AL central goodness. And then we'll take your lineup. We'll score it throughout the year and we will see who wins, but head over to fantasyalarm.com, become an all pro subscriber today. Get your hands on the fantasy alarm, fantasy baseball draft guide. And then Matt, is there a race next weekend? There is. Yes. It's okay. in Phoenix. Um, so timing gets a little thrown off cause they're in their own time zone there in mm. Arizona this time of year. Uh, but yes, they're racing at Phoenix, one mile track, 312 laps should be fun. Uh, we will have coverage just like we always do. Um, there it is. I may have an update. I don't know. I'll check my prospect rankings and see if, uh, Wyatt Lankford's moving up or not. We'll have to see. Until we talk to you again, there will be plenty of fantasy alarm for you. Baseball, NASCAR, there's basketball all week with James and John. I know Iggy does some prop bets as well throughout the week. So make sure you head over to fantasyalarm.com today for all of your needs. And like and subscribe here on YouTube or wherever you're listening to this podcast. Give me a follow on X at Colby R. Conway. Give Matt a follow at The Sellsman. And we will see you next week with the newest edition of Caught Stealing.